Welcome to a special webinar series brought to you by the AKC Canine Health Foundation. The following presentation from Dr. Kate Mears took place at the 2013 National Parent Club Canine Health Conference, hosted by the Foundation and sponsored by Nestle Purina Pet Care. Dr. Mears is a professor and the Associate Dean of Research at the North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine. She completed her DVM in 1990 at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and completed a small animal internship at North Carolina State University in 1991. She completed a cardiology residency at Texas A&M University and is board certified from the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine in Cardiology. Dr. Mears has a PhD in genetics from Texas A&M University and her areas of interest include the familial aspects of cardiovascular disease, especially cardiomyopathy. In this presentation, Dr. Mears will be discussing inherited cardiomyopathies and understanding the unique clinical and genetic aspects of this disease as it pertains to your breed. So this afternoon, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite things, which is I'm talking about heart muscle and muscle disease in dogs. And why is it one of my favorite things? I'm not sure exactly. You know, I, I decided to become a veterinarian and because uh, I love working with my dogs and my cats and my horses and always uh, in, enjoyed being around them. And somehow I went to veterinary school and then decided to become a cardiologist. And as a young cardiologist, I, we saw a lot of dogs with heart muscle disease, Doberman Pinchers, Great Danes, Boxers, um, sometimes Cocker Spaniels, generally large breed dogs. What one of our cardiologists would say, takes two hands to pick them up and they have a heart murmur, it probably is cardiomyopathy. And it was an easy, simple thing for me to learn. So, but we'd see a lot of these dogs with cardiomyopathy, heart muscle disease, and there wasn't much we could do for them. We'd give them some pills and we'd say to the owners, you know, hope he lives nine weeks. If we're lucky, he might die suddenly. If we're not lucky, he's going to become increasingly uncomfortable. She may stop eating. We may have to put her to sleep. We have no cure. We don't know what causes it. And uh, I thought, well, that's, that's not very rewarding. That's a really frustrating thing. And why can't we do anything about it? And so I got really interested in this heart muscle disease. If you're a human being with heart muscle disease, cardiomyopathy, they'll try to give you a transplant, heart transplant. And veterinary surgeons can do transplantations, but the big problem actually is we don't have donors, right? You know, a, a Doberman Pinscher doesn't ride a motorcycle without a helmet. So, <laughs> so we don't have donors for those hearts. And so maybe a better way to approach it is figure out why they get it and can we prevent it. And so I got really interested in the genetics of this disease and that's what I'll talk about today. Now what's interesting about genetic disease in people and in dogs is that it can be inherited but it doesn't, it may be there at birth, what we call congenital, which would be things like aortic stenosis in dogs, pulmonic stenosis, so they inherit the gene for it, and it is there from the time they are born. They have a murmur as a puppy. Or it can be adult onset. So, and that's what cardiomyopathies in most cases are. So dog is fine, born fine, lives to be a year or two years old, might develop a heart murmur or an arrhythmia at that time, usually beyond maturity. And most often, five years of age or older. It's still inherited. They have a gene for it, but for whatever reason, the gene doesn't get turned on until they're five or six years of age. You might think of it as coronary artery disease in human beings. We inherit a gene for it, but we don't often show it until we're 40 or 50. This is a similar type thing. So if you look at it as from the perspective of my breed has this heart problem. Whether it's cardiomyopathies, as I'm going to talk about today, or maybe you see a congenital disease, you can approach it the same way. There's really a three-pronged approach to finding a genetic cause for it and then using that to try to reduce the prevalence of it in your breed. The first thing is you really have to characterize the disease really well, and that means we need to know what it looks like in the clinic, what it looks like just before they get sick from it, what it looks like when they're sick from it, and what it looks like at necropsy or autopsy. We need to know 
how to really define this disease so we can separate it out and start looking at affected and unaffected dogs. And often we don't know that. We might say Great Dane cardiomyopathy looks a little like Doberman Pinscher or Borzois, and maybe our profession has called it just one disease. To really understand it and figure out what causes it, we need to tweeze it out and say, what is specific about your breed? So first, characterize the phenotype or clinical presentation, then figure out how it's inherited, and then go on to, can we find a genetic mutation for it? And I'll show you a couple of examples. So first thing, characterize the clinical presentation. And the two main examples I'm going to use today are dilated cardiomyopathy in the Doberman Pinscher and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy in the Boxer, because those are things that we know the most about at this point. But I'll talk about a few of the other breeds as well. All right, so dilated cardiomyopathy in the Doberman, or in, that'll be our... This is going to be our main example of dilated cardiomyopathy. But first, we need to talk about what this disease is. Anytime we say dilated cardiomyopathy, that means a heart muscle that is poorly functional. The term cardiomyopathy is very broad. It just means heart muscle disease. It doesn't tell you for sure it's inherited. It doesn't tell you what the gene is. It could even be caused by a nutritional or a virus problem. Cardiomyopathy is a broad, vague term. When it's dilated, that means the heart is not functioning very well, and they usually get it as an adult. In most breeds, almost all except for the Portuguese water dog, they get it over a year of age and usually five to seven years of age. The common breeds are the big dogs. We need two hands to lift up. Doberman pinchers in this country are number one affected with it. But certainly we see Great Danes, Irish Wolfhounds, Scottish Deerhounds. In Europe, they see more Newfoundlands, so large breed dogs. Now, very importantly, although our profession, my profession, has lumped all dilated cardiomyopathy into one disease, it is not all the same. If you are people that work with Doberman pinchers, even though, our, as veterinarians, we refer to the heart disease as dilated cardiomyopathy, it is a slightly different disease than that of a borzoi with dilated cardiomyopathy or a Great Dane or an Irish wolfhound. Veterinarians have lumped it, and I, I'll take the blame for this, we, we've lumped it all into one disease because at death, or when they're really sick and you look at them under an ultrasound, they look the same. But if you look carefully at them, the age they get it, what gender is affected, what are the first signs they show, how long do they live, what do they respond to as far as drugs, they are different diseases. Not dramatically different, but different enough that they are very likely to all have different causes. So Great Danes, Doberman Pinschers, same term, but a different disease. So let's look at the Doberman Pinscher as our example. Generally, average age of onset, six to eight years of age. Males and females equally represented. So we used to think males were, got it more frequently. It is possible the disease is slightly more severe in them, but equal gender representation. In their case, the heart becomes dilated, and often the first clinical signs you see are that the dog is coughing, not eating very well, maybe short of breath, maybe lost a little bit of weight lately, just not, not quite doing right. Sometimes sudden death, but most commonly cough, shortness of breath. And this is what it looks like on an echocardiogram. This is a normal heart, normal dog. Come on, there we go. So this is the left ventricle. There is, can you see, there we go. There's the left ventricle. And look at how vigorous these walls are coming towards each other. This is the affected Doberman here. The left ventricle is much bigger than it is here. And when we start it contracting, come on, come on, uh-oh. There we go. The wall really doesn't contract with the same vigor. You can see it just sort of comes in, but not nearly the same vigorousness as the normal one. So that's what it looks like in a Doberman pincher. 
the Great Dane, at least in North America, the European Great Danes may be slightly different, generally get the disease at seven or older. Males are overly represented. So we see more males with the disease than females in this country. And often, one of the first signs, instead of coughing, shortness of breath, is a very fast heart rate. So sometimes owners have no idea that they're sick, but they take them in for they're going to leave them at the vet while they go on vacation, or somebody does a physical exam on their annual evaluation, finds out that the heart rate is very elevated. And if you look at their electrocardiogram, they have an arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. So here is the normal dog. This is an EKG, or we might call it an ECG of a normal dog. And we can see these points, they're called R waves, are generally fairly regularly spaced, fairly far apart. If we look at the Great Dane, there are many more of them on the strip. That means the heart rate is very rapid. And they're very irregular. There's no pattern to them. In the normal dog, we'll often have some slow beats, fast, slow, fast, a very regular pattern. The Great Dane, very irregular and very rapid. That, that can happen in a Doberman, but much later down. In a Great Dane, that's usually the first thing that happens. That suggests to us probably not the same cause of the disease. So um, it's the echo on the Doberman that is often the first sign, ECG on a Great Dane. So even though this disease has the same name, we know that it is actually slightly different, and that means you can't interpret what we know in one breed directly to another. Yes, we can get some general information on what drugs generally work and what are the general diagnostic tests. But if we really want to figure out what is the gene or maybe there's a nutritional problem, what are the things that cause this disease, we have to do a focused study just on that breed to really figure out because each one is unique. It's just that as a profession, we haven't separated them very much. So our first job, if we're taking on figure out this inherited heart disease, whether it's cardiomyopathy or a congenital, a birth defect, is define that disease as closely as we can. The next thing we're going to do then is figure out how it's inherited. And is it inherited? Because maybe we're wrong. Maybe it's not a genetic trait. It's a nutritional trait or an environmental thing or a virus. So first, the, after we characterize it, the next thing we're going to do is figure out by looking at pedigrees, is it inherited? Do we see a lot overrepresented in a family and how? So in the Doberman Pinscher, we know that this is inherited in what's referred to as an autosomal pattern, meaning it's not carried on a sex chromosome. And it's a dominant trait. If a dog has one copy of a mutation, it likely shows the disease. Now, those of you that have heard me talk about Doberman Pinscher cardiomyopathy in the past may have seen this pedigree because I, I've used it before um, openly from a, a breeder who worked with me at Ohio State and was very forthcoming and, and happy to, to have me use it. Now, pedigree is, or uh, this diagram is basically a bunch of pedigrees put together. Circles are female dogs, squares are male, all the black ones have dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, D1... This dog was a very popular female show dog, and she was bred quite a bit, and so she produced a lot of offspring. Now, unfortunately, with cardiomyopathy, they don't show the disease until they're six or seven, so she had had many litters by the time her owner knew she had had an inherited heart disease. In the end, she produced 40 affected puppies. Exactly. Devastating. And it was devastating to the owner, who was a nurse and had a lot of medical training, and she felt horrible that she had produced this. It's not her fault. I mean, she was breeding a beautiful, healthy dog who showed up at six or seven years of age with an inherited trait too late and had already passed it on. But knowing this that it is a dominant trade and it's equally affected on males and females, at least helps us begin to think about how we can breed it out. 
but all of her work ultimately helped us define at least one gene for the disease. Now, let's go back and look at the Great Dane a second, because I said I think they're separate diseases. So this is a pedigree from a Great Dane, and these are Great Danes that I looked at from um, Texas A&M when I was there. And if you look at the pedigree, what do you see more black, circles or squares? Squares. So many, many more males showed the disease in the Great Dane. Now, people then assume, well, it's the sire's fault, of course, right, if it's passed from male to male. But it's not, right? It's that the female is carrying it, and it's what we call an X-linked recessive. So females are a silent carrier of it, at least in many Great Danes in North America. Now, there's some evidence that European Great Danes might be slightly different, but Great Danes appears to be an X-linked disease. So if this is on the X chromosome, and the Doberman Pinscher disease is not on an X chromosome, they are clearly different diseases. Even though veterinarians, are, my profession calls them all the same disease, they are not the same disease. So understanding that we know that these patterns of inheritance are different tells us that we really need to start approaching these diseases as separate things. But just having that bit of information moves us farther down the road. So after we characterize the disease, find out if it's genetic or not, and work on the pattern of inheritance, then we can take all of that information into the lab and say, okay, can we find a genetic marker for it? Well, this is a complicated disease even in human beings. There are over 24 different genes now known to cause this disease in people. So a mutation in any one of those genes can cause the disease. So very complicated. We now know of at least one gene in Doberman pinchers that can cause the disease, and that's a deletion in a gene called PDK4. So this is um, a lineup of DNA along the top, or you can just look at the colors. Each color represents a different base. And so in the Doberman pincher, all of these, this chunk of DNA is removed in the affected dog. So there's a big gap. And this piece of DNA becomes glued to that piece of DNA, prevents that whole strand of DNA from functioning normally. But why would we care? Well, it turns out that this piece of DNA is very responsible for feeding mitochondria. And mitochondria give the heart energy and, and give the heart the ability to keep contracting and perfusing and make the cardiac myocytes very happy. And if you look at, this is an electron microscope, and look at the mitochondria, you see they're very abnormal. So this is a normal dog's heart, and this arrow is pointing to a normal mitochondria. This is an affected Doberman pincher, and here's the mitochondria in the affected Doberman pincher. It's very big, and I don't know if those of you up front can see it very well, but it's almost moth-eaten in comparison to this. And that's because it's not getting enough energy. Now, you can do a couple of things with that bit of information. You can do genetic testing, because then you at least have one mutation you can test for. But you can also say, maybe, knowing that the mitochondria isn't getting fed well enough, maybe I could feed these dogs something different or exercise them differently to preserve their mitochondria. Maybe if I know about the mutation in this dog, I can manage them differently so they don't develop the clinical signs. So having all those bits of information may not solve the puzzle, totally cure them, but allows you to make educated decisions about your breed and how to manage them. Unfortunately, as I said, it's a pretty complicated disease. So we know that in people there are at least 24 different causes of them. We know that the gene in Doberman pinchers that causes it does not cause it in Great Danes. Well, we wouldn't expect it to because the Great Dane disease seems to be on the X chromosome, at least in some of them. But this gene doesn't cause the disease in borzois or deerhounds or wolfhounds or Newfoundlands either. It's just a Doberman pincher thing. And frustratingly, it's not even in all the Doberman pinchers with the disease. The, the European Doberman pinchers or Doberman pinchers that are more likely to die of sudden death appear to have a different genetic mutation. 
So knowing the mutation is useful, but it doesn't solve all of that breed's answers, unfortunately. It's a step in the right direction. Now, there are some other confusing aspects that I want to just spend a second on because I think as we start to develop these genetic tests, we want them to be black and white. That my dog has the mutation, that means he's going to develop the disease. My dog doesn't have the mutation, he'll never de develop the disease. But that's not true because we know at least in this disease, there's at least more than one cause, genetic cause. So if your dog is negative for it, doesn't mean it can't ever get the disease because it could get it from another mutation. The other thing is, if it has the mutation, it may or may not get very sick from it because there's something called genetic penetrance. And penetrance means how severely you show the disease if you have a genetic mutation. So you have, there are examples in human beings where they're twins that have the exact same genetic mutation. One of the twins needs a heart transplant. The other has a soft murmur and lives very well with it. Same thing in a litter of dogs with genetic mutations. You may have eight puppies. Two of them go on to die of this cardiomyopathy. Two of them develop very mild disease, and two of them never get sick. It's not because the genetic test isn't any good or the mutation isn't real. It's that biology is really complex. You guys know that. You know, you try to breed dogs that have a certain ability to do agility or look a certain way, and we don't necessarily get what we want because it's a really complex thing. Genetic penetrance says that at least in some human beings, only 20 or 30 percent of people that have a genetic mutation ever get sick. So you have a genetic mutation, but lots of them never have any problems from it. Why is that? Well, that would be really helpful if we knew that, because if we knew the things that defined penetrance, we could use that with the genetic test to help make decisions. And it's probably things like exercise, diet, might be other genes we inherit all at once. All of those things, regardless of whether you're studying the genetics of heart disease or the genetics of epilepsy, I bet, or genetics of hip dysplasia, this issue with penetrance and multiple genes is going to bother us. Genetics is not black and white. It's not a straightforward thing. And so we're going to have to understand the whole idea of penetrance and turning genes on and other modifiers as we start to interpret genetic tests. And I know there's a panel on genetic testing tomorrow, and I, I bet that's one of the things they talk about. So I just wanted to spend the last uh, 10 minutes or so talking about another form of cardiomyopathy, how you do the same sort of walkthrough to identify the molecular cause. And that's in boxers. So there's a disease called boxer arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. It's a really long term, and cardiologists were in general sort of lazy, so we like acronyms. So this is boxer ARVC. And years ago, it was called boxer dilated cardiomyopathy or cardiomyopathy. It really fits best with this disease to be called ARVC. I said that cardiomyopathy simply means heart muscle disease. Doesn't necessarily mean the heart is big and dilated and doesn't pump very well. Just means the heart muscle is abnormal. So with this disease, if you look at it under a microscope, what you find is that the muscle is very abnormal, but it, it actually still contracts quite well. So this is a microscopic slide of a normal dog heart, and you see how nice and pink it is. This is a microscopic slide of an affected boxer. And so this really, again, has, a, I think, very moth-eaten appearance. The cells have died, and they get replaced with fat. Now, the cells that are there still function pretty well. They contract well. But what happens instead with this disease is electricity doesn't conduct very well. So when you look at an electrocardiogram, an EKG or an ECG in a boxer, you see very abnormal heartbeats. So this is an ECG, again, if a normal dog, I expect to see nice, tall R waves with sort of a pattern of slow, 
fast, slow, fast again. But all of these R waves should look the same. When we look at the affected dogs, we see some small normal complexes and then sort of a zigzagging wide bizarre complexes. Those are all referred to as VPCs. And those can go as fast as 300 or 400 beats per minute and sometimes basically short out and the dog either falls over and then sometimes people run over and give it CPR and the dog comes back to life. That dog was probably going to recover anyway, but we like to think we intervene successfully. And some of them don't. Some of them fall over and die, and, and that's it. They have electrically shorted out from their disease. So first thing was characterizing this disease. And in the early 80s, Dr. Neil Harpster started characterizing this disease in Boston. And then, honestly, you guys in the 90s spent a lot of money studying this disease and saying, what does it really look like at, in the clinics and at the necropsy floor to help us define it? And then you funded it so you could figure out how it was inherited. And it's inherited just like it is in the Doberman Pinscher. It's an autosomal trait. Usually shows up between six and eight years of age, and the odds of showing it gets higher as they get older. And similar to the Dobermans, there is a genetic deletion that causes this disease. So in these dogs, same kind of funny strip of DNA that you see the different colors, but all of this is removed, and so that prevents that DNA from functioning normally. Because this chunk of DNA that is removed had some function, and it was supposed to make a protein, actually, that helped cardiac cells hook together. So this is a little cartoon of cardiac cells. This is one cardiac cell, and this is another. And there are a bunch of proteins that act as a hinge between the two cardiac cells. They hook those two cells together, and they're flexible. So when the dog's heart is pumping, because it's chasing a Frisbee or running after a squirrel or on a dog jog thing, the, that heart can go up and down and up and down, and that hinge is swinging back and forth very easily. With this disease, that piece of DNA is responsible for part of the hinge. And so when you mess up that hinge, these cells no longer connect, they pull apart, they can't speak to each other anymore, they die, they get replaced by fat, and ultimately that leads to the arrhythmia. So bad hinge, dead cells, this bad electrical system, and the dog that ultimately dies from it either falling over in the yard or sometimes his heart muscle becomes very weak as well. And it turns out that if you have two copies of the deletion, you're homozygous for it, you have more of those abnormal beats than if you just have one copy. So this is a little chart. This is number of abnormal heartbeats per day. Normal dogs have a small number of abnormal heartbeats anyway. Not very many, um, usually less than 100, but some. If you only have one bad copy, so your hinge works pretty well, you have an average of two to 3,000 abnormal beats per day. If you have two bad copies, you have about 8,000 abnormal beats a day. And if you have that many VPCs, that many abnormal beats, it's such a wacky electrical system that we also know now that eventually it leads the heart to dilate a little bit like that Doberman Pinscher. Only usually the homozygous dogs, or I shouldn't say only, but the dogs that have two copies of the bad gene are much more likely to get the dilated form and therefore much more likely to die of this disease. Dogs that have one copy of the gene develop abnormal heartbeats but are usually pretty responsive to medication. We know in the boxer that there is that penetrance issue as well. So about 70% of dogs that have the mutation show some form of the disease. That means that 30% don't. They never get sick from it. So you'd love to know what's special about those 30%. Is it something they eat? Is it something those owners do with them, a special supplement or exercise or not exercise? What is the key there? But importantly, I think it's really good for us to know that there is this penetrance thing because 
sometimes we use that to think, well, this test must be bad, or this mutation can't be right because my dog never got sick from it. Penetrance is a very well-known genetic phenomenon in human medicine as well. It's just not well understood. We know it exists, but it's not well understood. So right now, this is one of the things that you are funding. So we're doing a study where we look at dogs that have one copy of this mutation, collect their DNA, and are looking for modifiers, genetic modifiers that make some of the dogs sick and some of the dogs protected. And so um, we have a Facebook page for that. I have to say, I'm not very good with Facebook, but I have a new graduate student who is like, what, you're not doing Facebook, and you're not you know, tweeting this sort of stuff. And so, um, so I thought, well, that's a great idea. I hadn't thought about it. But so now we have a Facebook page where we do updates on the study, and it's a terrific idea. I should have thought of it, but he pushed me that way. And then, very briefly, I'm just going to end in three or four minutes about how you might interpret the results of these tests. So you now can do genetic tests for both Dobermans and the Boxer disease. But what does it mean? So you would hope that whatever lab you use sends you information on some interpretation. And this should be true if you're doing heart genetic tests or eye genetic tests or coat color or hip or whatever the genetic test. You hope they give you a little bit of information, provide some genetic counseling when you get the information back. So in both of these diseases, if you get a negative result, that's great. It doesn't mean the dog can never get heart disease. It just means it doesn't have the mutation of concern. And so its risk of this type of heart disease is much, much lower, but it could still get heart disease. So you still want to evaluate it, still see your veterinarian, um, maybe still see a cardiologist. If it has one copy of the gene, it's heterozygous, that dog has an increased risk of developing the disease. But because of genetic penetrance, it might not develop the disease. And you might not know until this dog is six or seven years of age. And you are going to have to make a decision about breeding it. So that's a tricky thing, because if this is a dog that has the mutation but has low penetrance, that would be a good dog to keep in the gene pool. So what you'll have to do at this point is carefully follow that dog and use that information. Is this a really good dog to be used for breeding, or was it kind of on the borderline anyway? It didn't have a very good personality, wasn't very smart, uh, you know, was always eating the wrong things. He ate the, somebody told me they had a dog that ate a, the bath towel three times, and they've done three different surgeries for it now. So maybe it's not very bright, so there are other reasons you don't want to breed it. But if it's a really, has all the right traits, and it's positive heterozygous, and you don't see evidence that it has heart disease, maybe you take a risk and breed it to a negative dog. Breed it to a negative dog, and then screen that next litter and try to find a puppy in that next generation that is negative, that has the good traits that you like, that you can keep. Now, maybe there isn't one. So maybe you have to do this experiment more than once. And that is OK, because it would actually be a bad thing for us to make drastic decisions using these, these genetic tests and remove too many dogs that are carrying the mutation at once, because it shrinks the gene pool, which is very detrimental. So ideally, over time, you are breeding to a negative dog and gradually selecting against that mutation. So we're using this to guide our decisions. Now, <clears throat> we're going to continue to use them in conjunction with our other clinical tests. So we're not intending this as a single test to remove all the dogs in a program. Whoops, did I skip? I skipped positive homozygous, sorry. If it's positive homozygous, it has two copies of the gene, that's a dog I'm probably not going to ever use because it's for sure going to pass on the trait. Now, even then, you might make exceptions. Maybe this is the very best dog. After 30 years, you've been following this line, and it's, you've worked on it for your mother worked on it with her line, and you inherited it. And, you know, we follow these things. Maybe you take a risk and breed it to a negative. But a homozygous would, because it has two copies of the bad gene, really be a dog you'd want to have serious consideration whether you'd use it. 
So again, use these genetic tests to guide your decisions, not as a black and white test. And because this isn't the only cause of heart disease, genetic tests for heart disease don't replace clinical evaluations. So what I really tried to emphasize here is that even though our profession, my profession, you, and probably many of your profession, uses cardiomyopathy as a broad term, it has very specific breed differences. And we really need to start focusing on what are the different breed differences if we really under, want to understand it. Now, as you start to do that work, it might take you a decade to figure out. I mean, things move faster now than they used to, but to go through clinical studies, genetic studies to understand mode of inheritance, molecular studies can take several years and sometimes longer. So you don't want to lose faith in the system. It takes time. Sometimes you get lucky and you'll do a study and in two years you'll find something. Sometimes it'll take a decade. But once you have that mutation, then you can use it to gradually reduce the prevalence of the disease over time. We're not trying to make dramatic decisions. But you might also be able to use it to make educated decisions about how to modify behavior, what you feed them, how you exercise them, the best drug for them to really manage those cases. So I'm going to stop there. I wanted to thank you very much for all of your support over the years. Thank you to each of the presenters that made the 2013 National Parent Club Canine Health Conference a huge success. To learn more about CHF and to make a secure online donation, please visit www.akcchf.org. Thank you for listening.